Hello, my name is Brian Lee and I have a presentation today about drone use in agriculture. I am with the University of Wyoming Extension located at the CEREC Research and Extension Center. Um, and this presentation today hopefully will help you understand what your rights are as a drone operator and also uh, how to not get in trouble basically uh, because we all want to be safe and responsible uh, if we are going to be using drones. I assume you know in general what dr drones can be used for. They're becoming increasingly more popular in our world. Uh, they're also becoming more inexpensive and also technologically advanced, making them more useful to people. Um, and so I have a few tips uh, on what you need to do, uh, the bare minimum to make sure that you are doing everything correctly and that you're being responsible. Um, first of all, every drone must be registered. Uh, the FAA does this so they know uh, who is flying where, uh, make sure you're not doing anything you shouldn't. Also, um, who to contact if somebody finds a drone somewhere. Um, so register your drone and I've got the website stated there. Um, another thing that a lot of people might not be comfortable with but maybe should do is look at an aviation map. I know this can be intimidating. You say, I don't even know where I can find one of those at. Um, go on the FAA website and look around. Um, this will help you understand uh, different airspaces, where airports are, um, where towers are, where you can fly and where you cannot fly. Um, another thing that you must do all the time is fly under 400 feet. I know um, that might be might seem like um, a long ways up, but when you get in the air and the drone's really going, 400 feet uh, can come pretty quickly. Another thing that you have to do is fly within line of sight of your drone. Um, this is for safety. It's for to reduce accidents. Um, there is a way that you can have a secondary pilot who you are in contact with that can. Um, Keep an eye on the drone, um, even if you cannot see it. If they are in contact with you, um, you're still legal. And another thing that is important that where people typically get into issues with um, are privacy. Uh, respect people's privacy. You know, don't use drones uh, for anything other than their their purpose. Um, and if you do plan on, or there's a chance that you might be over some private property, it's a good idea to get a hold of that landowner, let them know that you're going to be out doing that so that there isn't an issue with um, privacy being violated. The whole premise of this presentation is to help you understand how to protect yourself. Nobody wants to be in trouble with the FAA or um, have somebody come after them uh, or you're being liable for something. Um, so here are some times and places where you should never fly. Never fly near other aircraft, uh, or especially near airports, and the rule is five miles. Um, if you are in, flying somewhere and another aircraft enters the area, you must give way. Um, never fly over groups of people. Um, drones can, even though they only weigh a couple pounds, if you lose contact with your drone um, and it falls from the sky, it has rotors that are spinning at a high rate of speed and can potentially hurt somebody. You don't want to be liable for somebody's injury or damaged property. Um, it never fly near emergencies such as fires. People are, um, firefighters are out attempting to save lives and property. Don't get in the middle of that because you want to get a cool picture. It's not worth it. Um, and also another place that people tend to think it's okay to fly is national parks. It is not. Uh, this is <laughs> highly illegal. Um, national parks are there to protect wildlife and also nature. And let it be that way. Um, you don't want to be uh, get a bill <laughs> from the FAA or a fine from the FAA for flying in a place that you're not supposed to. You should never fly under the influence of drugs or alcohol. A rule is eight hours from bottle to throttle. Um, kind of a catchy saying. Uh, we don't tend to make good decisions when 
somebody is under the influence um, and flying is no time to experiment with that. So just don't do it. Another thing uh, to think about, especially in Wyoming, is it's tough to fly when it's windy. It's windy a lot in Wyoming. Find a time when you can fly safely and um, not get in, get into a bad situation. Uh, typically, first thing in the morning is a good time to fly, so take advantage of one of those times. There are a few options for you to legally fly your drone in the United States. Uh, one option designated FAA is, is for heat or recreational purposes. You still must register your aircraft. It is, it is over 0.555 pounds. Um, this one must be under 55 pounds. That's a rather large drone, um, but as tech technology increases, um, um, there might be the possibility for drones carrying um, larger payloads. Uh, for, for this option, you do, you do not have a, a remote certification, um, but you must know kind of some of the basics of drone operation. Um, as we just discussed, to fly within five miles of an airport, you must also line, line up sight or have a, a spotter drone, so you know and have your eyes on that drone at all times. Um, you must also not, not fly at night or, or after civil twilight, and civil twilight, don't worry, I had to get up too, that is dis described as period after, after sunset or before sunrise, ending or beginning when the sun is about six days below the horizon and enough light for ordinary outdoor occupations. Um, so if you know what six degrees below the horizon, horizon looks like, um, maybe don't, don't fly. Think about um, typical hunting light um, uh, um, to roughly the, same, roughly the same time period. The first option to flying legally is to fly under a hobby or recreation designation. You still must register your aircraft if it is over 0.55 pounds, um, and the website is there. You can see um, the, the drone also must be under 55 pounds, uh, and that that would be a, an extremely large drone. But as technology increases, there's certainly the possibility of getting a drone that big. Uh, you do not need a remote pilot certification which is the pilot license essentially for flying a drone um, and you still have to follow the rules don't fly within five miles of an airport you have to keep line of sight of the drone or have a spotter like we talked about you can have a spotter go out further away um, that is able to keep an eye on the drone and keep in radio contact with you um, do not fly at night or at or after civil twilight um, I had to look this up, don't worry. Uh, with Civil Twilight is described as the period after sunset or before sunrise, ending or beginning when the sun is about six degrees below the horizon and enough light for ordinary outdoor occupations. The second option for flying legally is to go ahead and get a remote pilot certification and fly your drone for commercial use. So commercial use is designated as Anything that is done for a job or for financial gain. So if you are taking photos for a realtor, that technically is commercial use. Um, you still must register your aircraft as always and re-register every uh, three years um, with that website there. Um, and it must be under 55 pounds in weight. Um, you will need to get a remote pilot certification from the FAA, which is that pilot's license, and it needs to be renewed every two years. Um, you also must report lost drones or any wrecks to the FAA. Um, they review it just like uh, larger airplanes. So the, the pilot's license is a an FAA license, and uh, it has all the uh, requirements and important details that go with it. If you do get your remote pilot certification and there is a situation where you need an exemption to fly um, where we typically cannot, there are ways to do that. Um, these, these following options are all subject to an FAA waiver. Um, so for commercial use, there are situations where you can fly 
outside of line of sight with an FAA waiver for uh, a certain purpose. Um, you can fly closer to aircraft, airports, or people with an FAA waiver for certain situations. You can potentially fly in controlled airspace um, and also during nighttime if need be. These are special, special situations that they uh, review on a case-to-case -case basis. They probably won't give waivers to all of them uh, depending on what is going on or what you're specifically asking for. But the process to do this is actually not too bad. It's all done online now and they can get through them pretty quickly. The process for taking the remote pilot certification test is fairly straightforward. Uh, and you, again, you only need this if you're planning on using your drone commercially. Uh, testing centers in our area uh, are Cody, Casper, Cheyenne, and Sydney, Nebraska. Uh, you can go and it's all online. Uh, there are online resources from the FAA that you study and will help you attempt to pass the test. This needs to be renewed every two years at a cost of $150. Um, so again, commercially, if you're planning on using your drone, so anytime basically that you're using this for your work or for any type of financial gain, uh, you should get the remote pilot certification. There are a few other resources that are worth noting that are useful, um, especially for commercial use, but also for hobby or recreational use. Um, the a a thing called NOTAMS, which is Notice to All Airmen. It is a resource put out by the FAA that designates any special exemptions for certain areas. So say there is a an air show going on at an airport in Cheyenne, or there is a, a, a special flight that is taking place over your area, or a weather occurrence that you need to be aware of. These will all be on a NOTAMS um, notice and uh, that is a good thing to check out if you're planning on flying in a certain area there's an app that the faa has developed uh, to try to help protect drone operators it's called before you fly it's a mobile app you can log on before you fly and it will tell you if you're in a restricted area if you're within five miles of an airport if there's a weather issue if there are other things going on in your area it's good to check out. Um, another thing that I think is important to do, and I've mentioned this before, is to ask people around you, ask neighbors uh, if it's okay if you fly, especially if there's a chance you'll be over private land, especially if it's a windy day or um, you're checking something out. Um, and then um, another another thing that you should should really, it's important to remember um, if you're planning on flying at nighttime or close to an airport, uh, make sure you try to get an FAA waiver. So don't take the chance with um, being somewhere where you're not supposed to be. I think it is a very good idea to get the remote pilot certification. And, and this is one reason why um, this is an aeronautical map of the city of Denver. Um, and all these lines, numbers, colors, uh, dots, <laughs> are reasons why. Um, there are a lot of things going on in our world, especially in the aviation world, that we may not even be aware of. Um, and it's important that you try to protect yourself. Um, obviously, Denver, there's a lot going on, a lot of airports, um, a lot of uh, towers and tall buildings. Um, but this is just an example of everything that Pilots have to check out and know what's going on. So before you go out and send a drone up in downtown Denver, uh, you better make sure to know where you're at. This is another aeronautical map of the Evanston uh, and Kimmer area. Um, again, this is not downtown Denver, but there are still a lot going on, a lot of things going on in this map. If you'll look, you can see um, a couple of airports in the area. There's also there are also um, flight paths that commercial flights take, uh, towers, um, and other things that we need to be aware of. Uh, so even in rural Wyoming, 
uh, we can't just go fly wherever we want. It's important to know what's going on. So I do recommend taking the remote pilot certification test. There are some operational pitfalls that the FAA outlines as to the reasons uh, why pilots might get into trouble. Um, these are important to be aware of and to understand if you are a drone pilot. Uh, the first one is peer pressure. We face peer pressure daily, um, and this can be especially true if you are working with a, a landowner or a business or a company, um, and it's almost the end of the day. They want that one last job done, and you're the drone operator. They say, oh, why don't you just do it while you're here? Um, you need to think about what you're doing. Don't fall into peer pressure. This is your drone. This is your uh, potentially your license at stake. So uh, make good decisions. Um, and uh, along with this, make sure you're in a good mindset. Uh, you're not taking unnecessary risks. Um, you're prepared to fly that day. Uh, one thing that is never good when we're talking machinery or equipment is a get it done quick attitude that usually will end in risky behavior, unnecessary risk being taken. Uh, don't don't try to get it done quick, try to get it done correctly. Don't wreck your drone. Uh, and another thing is it's possible to get behind the aircraft. Uh, it's called in the aviation world uh, where you are reacting to what that airplane or um, aircraft is doing instead of um, m taking um, steps ahead and planning. Um, so, you know, if you get behind the aircraft, uh, maybe take a break. Uh, if you're if you're able, get get out of the sky um, and try to make good decisions. Um, situational awareness. Be aware. You know, look around if there. Are things going on? If there's weather coming in, if um, there is another airplane in the area, uh, be situationally aware. Don't don't get tunnel vision. Um, and one that can really get drone operators in trouble is uh, not operating uh, with adequate battery. Uh, you might be too far out to get back to where you are safely. Uh, and you'll have to put the drone down in an area you might not want to. Um, better safe than sorry. Um, the typical drone battery only lasts somewhere from you know maybe 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, plan ahead, and then have a plan. Don't try to do too much. Um, again, this these drones can be pretty expensive. You don't want to wreck your drone on um, an unnecessary risk. I didn't want to talk about drones without talking about data collection and more importantly data ownership. Uh, this is a topic that is very popular right now, um, especially in this time in agriculture. We are creating and processing millions of data points daily, uh, whether it's through finance or on our computers or our phones, whether you know it or not, we're, co we're creating data points constantly. Um, and it's one thing that's going to be more important as we go forward, um, uh, this idea of data ownership. Um, and the Wyoming stock growers are actually well aware of this. They've been working on this in the Wyoming legislature since 2015, um, an attempt to protect landowners from unlawful or unknown uh, data collection on their properties. Um, and in precision agriculture with um, precision planters and precision sprayers. The idea of data ownership is important. Um, who owns the data that is being generated? Is it the equipment manufacturer or is it the landowner? And it can get pretty murky sometimes. Um, so make sure that you have an idea of what's going on and know your rights. Um, and it, it, kind of an interesting example is this picture on the right, um, Naruto uh, took this self-portrait in 2011 with a camera owned by a photographer. Uh, this photo 
has been the subject of a years-long copyright battle that has been recently uh, settled, it appears. Um, so this uh, Naruto, he took this photo on this photographer's camera. The photographer attempted to capitalize on this um, and profit from this photo because it's a it's a pretty neat photo. Um, so PETA actually filed suit against the photographer, the, the camera owner, um, saying that he shouldn't be able to um, profit off of this photo because the this primate took the photo. Um, so this idea of data ownership uh, is at play here. Um, and it was actually, it was settled that the camera owner would donate uh, any profit back to wildlife preservation. So it was kind of an interesting story. I think as we've gone through this, you've probably found yourself thinking of ways that you might be able to utilize a drone, or you've already figured out a way to utilize a drone. There are a lot of success stories in agriculture. We, we work in big open areas with uh, these specialized situations. Um, and one that we've, or some some success stories we've seen are that rancher finding that one lost calf that they couldn't find or saving time by uh, sending the drone up to figure out where the herd at the herd is at in a large paddock um, you could possibly locate fence issues with your drone by flying down fence lines or checking water in that uh, hard to hard to get to tank area that takes you Maybe it's only half a mile away, but it takes you half an hour to get there. Uh, you could possibly find a stuck tower on a corn pivot or a stress spot in a field for various reasons. A, a few ways the university is utilizing drones. Uh, we've been mapping uh, for crop health at the CERC location. Uh, this is kind of a neat graphic on the right here showing um, plant health across a, a corn pivot. You can see uh, skips in the planner. You can see the pivot tracks. Uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, we have a researcher who has been utilizing drones to track invasive species in grass uh, very successfully, actu actually. Um, but uh, for the protection of the state and private landowners, um, important to find different ways to, to track invasive species. So a lot of cool ideas out there. I think this is just the beginning. Uh, drones are only going to get more popular as they become cheaper and also more effective. So uh, that's my presentation. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. And um, thank you for listening.